Namaskaram. That was Sadhu Om uh, singing the verse 8 of Sri Arunach Chakram Lai, which is the verse that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, this verse is, um, the central idea in this verse is, uh, well, it's a continuity of what Bhagavan said in the previous verse. So just to remember what Bhagavan said in the previous verse, it was Unaye Matri Oda Dulatin Mel Urudiai Irupai Arunachala. That is that means uh, Arunachala, may you be firmly on the mind so that it does not run out deceiving you. That is uh, the connection between this verse and the verse we're going to be talking about today, the nature of the mind is to be constantly running outwards. Um, uh, so in the previous verse, the prayer was that our nature should be firmly on the mind or be seated firmly on the mind. In, in this verse, it's also talking about the nature of the mind. But here, he, he, the prayer is slightly different, but it amounts to the same thing. That is what Bhagavan sings in this verse is, U sutrulam vida dunekan dadangida unnarahe kataranachala. The basic meaning of that is, uh, Arunachala, so that seeing you uninterruptedly, the mind which roams about the world subsides, show your beauty. What that implies, we slightly expand it, um, if that is if to draw out the implication, um, Arunachala, so that seeing or looking at you uninterruptedly, my mind, which by its very nature roams incessantly about the world under the sway of its Vishaya Vasanas, subsides, settles, submits, ceases entirely and forever in you, uh, thereby being brought under the sway of your grace, show me your beauty. That implies the infinite beauty of your real nature, which is unlimited, unalloyed, and unceasing happiness. Um, the first word of this verse is ur, which is a, a Tamil word. It's actually, a, it's not only Tamil, it's in many of the Dravidian languages. It's a word that means uh, a place, particularly a place where people live, such as a village, a town, or a city. That is why so many, um, the names of so many towns and villages and cities in South India end with the word Ur. Uh, Bangalore, Mysore, Kadalore, Vellore, Polo, Tirukoilo, so many, so, so many place names end with the word Ur. So well, basically it means place, but it means particularly a place where people live, such as, as I say, a village or a town or a city. However, in this context, Bhagavan is using it as a metonym for the whole world, for the world as a whole. And also, um, Murugan explains it as being a double metonym, because firstly, it, that Ur is a, a, uh, is a metonym for the world, and the world is a metonym for all the vishayas, the objects or phenomena that constitute the world. So Murugana describes it as a, a double metonym. Um, uh, so, it, so it amounts to what, what the word or is implies here is the world as a whole and everything that constitutes the world, all the vishayas. Um, uh, the second word is sutru. Sutru is a verb that means uh, to revolve, spin, whirl, roam, or wander about. 
And in uh, sutra is the root of a verb, but in this case, the root is used in the sense of an adjectival participle. Uh, that means roaming or which roams about. And it is an adjective to ullam, uh, the third word, word which ullam means um, uh, the heart uh, or, or the mind. In this case, it means the mind. Um, so ursutralam uh, means the world roaming mind or the mind which roams about the world. That is, the very nature of the mind is to always dwell on things other than itself, namely the shares, objects or phenomena. And the totality of all the shares is what is called the world. And in this context, the world means not only the external world of uh of a seemingly external world of physical phenomena, but also the internal world of mental phenomena. Collectively, the internal world and the external world make up the world that the Bhagavan is referring to here. Um, since the mind is by nature fickle and unsteady, it does not dwell for long on any one vishaya, but is constantly wandering from one to another in search of happiness, which it wrongly believes it can obtain from them. So this deeply ingrained habit of the mind to wander about, moving perpetually from one vishaya to another, is what Bhagavan describes here as uh, ursutrudal, roaming or wandering about the world. Um, why is it the nature of the mind to roam about the world like this? Uh, in this context, ulam means the mind in the sense of ego, namely the subject. That is, when we use the term mind, we can be talk, we can be referring to thoughts in general, all other thoughts being just objects, or we can be uh, re referring to the mind as the knower, as the subject, that which knows all thoughts. In other words, uh, the mind as knower is ego. So the essence of the mind, what the mind essentially is, is ego. So here, what he refers to here as ulam of the mind means ego, the subject, the knower or experiencer of all the shares. And ego is a false awareness of ourself. Because whenever we rise as ego, we're always aware of ourselves as I am this body, which is not what we actually are. What we actually are is Satchidananda. That means pure being, Sat, pure awareness, Chit, and pure happiness, Ananda, which is infinite, eternal, indivisible, and immutable, as Bhagavan implies in verse 28 of Upadesha India. What he says in verse 28 of Upanishadi is Tanadil Yadu Enna Tan Terry Hill Pin Anadi Ananta Sat Undipara Akanda Chidananda Undipara. What that means is if one knows what the real nature of oneself is, then beginningless, endless, unbroken existence, consciousness, happiness. Um, he doesn't, there's, there's no explicit subject in the main clause, but we can take it either, we can take it in two, in, we can interpret it in two ways, but the two ways are complementary. We can take it to mean if one knows what the nature of oneself is, then what the nature of oneself is, is beginningless, endless, um, an unbroken existence, awareness, happiness. That's one way of taking it. Or we can take it to mean then what alone will exist is beginningless, endless, unbroken, Satchitananda. It amounts to the same because when we know ourselves, what exists, what will then remain is only ourself. Um, because everything else appears only in the name, in the view of ego. Uh, as, we, as we know from our experience in sleep, when we don't rise as ego, nothing else seems to exist. Only when we rise as ego in waking and dream do other things seem to exist. When we know what we actually are, ego will thereby be destroyed because ego is a false awareness of ourself. And then what will remain is only anadi, ananta, akanda, satchidananda. Anadi means beginningless. Ananta means endless or limitless. Um, so uh, anadi, beginningless, it implies it has no beginning in time. Ananta implies 
it has no end in time. That's one meaning. So anadi ananta means it's eternal. But ananta means endless. It also implies limitless. It's got no, it's got no outer limits. So it, uh, having no outer limits, it's infinite. So it's both eternal and infinite is the implication of these two words. And the next word is akanda. Akanda means unbroken, undivided or unfragmented. That is what Satchitananda is one indivisible infinite whole. Uh, there's nothing, because it's infinite, there's nothing other than it. And because it's undivided, it has no, it, it doesn't consist of parts. It is a partless, indivisible, immutable whole. And Sat means, as I said, Sat means pure being, Chit means pure awareness, and Ananda means pure happiness. These are not three things. These are one and the same. That is, pure being is itself pure happiness. Uh, pure uh, pure awareness, which is itself pure happiness. So sat is chit and ananda. Chit is sat and ananda. And ananda is sat and chit. So all three are one. One and indivisible, akanda. We, they cannot be divided. We cannot, we cannot separate awareness from existence or existence from awareness. Um, and we can't separate true happiness from either. Um, uh, so our very nature is pure being, pure awareness and pure happiness and that is eternal, infinite and indivisible so since we are infinite happiness when we rise as ego and thereby limit ourselves as the extent of a finite body we seemingly separate ourselves from the infinite happiness that we actually are so we naturally, as ego, we naturally crave to regain such happiness. And we cannot be set satisfied with anything less than infinite happiness. That's why the very nature of ego is to be constantly looking for uh, happiness. However, as a seemingly finite ego, we cannot experience infinite happiness, but can only experience finite semblances of true happiness. And since we have seemingly separated ourselves from the true happiness that we actually are, it seems to be something other than ourselves, and therefore to be lacking in ourselves. So we naturally seek it outside ourselves, among the shares. The shares means objects or phenomena. Since we wrongly believe that happiness can be obtained only from things other than ourselves, namely the shares, such things seem to be the cause of, of both our happiness and our and unhappiness. So we like and desire those things that we believe will make us happy, and we dislike, feel averse to, or fear those things that we believe will make us unhappy. This is this is one of the tricks of Maya. We we desire the things that make us happy, and when we get the things that we desire, that seems to give us happiness. So that reinforces the idea. Um, if we desire, say, money, um, when we because of our desire for money, when we get some money, when we have a, um, if we have no money, then we desire. Or oh, if I had at least a hundred rupees, it would seem to be a, a lot. When we get a hundred rupees momentarily we're happy, but then we're quickly dissatisfied. This 100 rupees can be spent in a day. So I need more than 100 rupees. So we want 1,000, then we want 10,000. However much we have, we are never satisfied. This is the nature of the mind. So, But we think, because I was happy when I got 100 rupees, how much more happy I'll be when I get 1,000, and how much more happy I'll be when I get 10,000. Such is the nature of the mind. And such is the nature, well, the mind is Maya, as Bhagavan said. This is Maya, right? this constant, um, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, something that reinforces itself. It's a, it's a self, like a self-fulfilling um, uh, prophecy. That is, we believe we'll get happiness from it, so we have desire for it. Because we have desire for it, when we get it, it makes us happy. But quickly, we're dissatisfied, so we want more of it to make us more happy. So th this is endless. This is, the, this is the delusion that we as ego are caught up in. This is the delusion called Maya. 
And as Bhagavan said, Maya is nothing other than ego, or nothing other than the mind. The mind itself is Maya. Um, therefore, we as ego or mind incessantly roam about the world seeking to obtain or experience whatever we believe will make us happy and seeking to avoid whatever we believe will make us unhappy. Seeking happiness or satisfaction in this way is the very nature of ourself as ego. But nothing will satisfy us completely or lastingly until we regain our own real nature, uh, Swarupa, which alone is infinite and eternal happiness. Seeking perfect happiness or satisfaction is not wrong. But what is wrong is seeking it in anything other than ourself because it does not exist in anything other than ourself. Since we ourselves are infinite happiness, we can experience such happiness only by being aware of ourselves as we actually are, as Bhagavan teaches us in the first paragraph of Nana. This first paragraph of Nana is a very, very important paragraph, and it's particularly significant because this was not part of the original um, uh, uh, answers that Bhagavan gave to Shiv Prakash and Palai. When he rewrote the question and answer form, the earlier question and answer form of Nana, which at that time had 30 questions and answers, when he rewrote it in the form of an essay, he made many changes. But one of the most important changes, he added this paragraph, because this really summarizes uh, what is the, what is the so what is the aim of all his teachings? That is, what is the one thing we all seek is happiness. That is what he's talking about here. What he says in this uh, first paragraph is: there's one long sentence and then a short sentence. The long sentence begins: since all living beings want or like to be happy, or to be always happy without what is called misery. Since for everyone the greatest love is only for oneself, and since happiness alone is the cause of love, what he means by happiness alone is the cause of love, we love only those things that we believe will contribute towards our happiness. So what can we infer from the fact that we love ourselves? It implies that we ourselves are happiness. That is what Bhagavan is pointing out here. Um then he goes on to say, so there are those three sense clauses, three reasons he gives. Since all sentient beings uh, like to be always happy without misery, since for everyone, since everyone has greatest love for themselves, in the way it's expressed in Tamil, for everyone, the greatest love is only for oneself. That means everyone has greatest love for oneself. And since happiness alone is the cause for love, in order to attain that happiness, which is one's own swabhava, one's real nature, which one experiences daily in sleep, which is devoid of mind. This is another reason why happiness is our real nature, because since in sleep, sleep is devoid of mind. That means it's devoid of everything other than ourself. In sleep, what exists is only we ourselves. But we are perfectly happy. So from that, we can infer that happiness is our real nature. When we experience ourself alone in complete isolation from everything other than ourself, as in sleep, we are perfectly happy. So happiness is our real nature. But what, what he says here is, in order to obtain that happiness, which is one's own uh, real nature, which one experiences daily in sleep, which is devoid of mind, oneself, knowing oneself is necessary. Uh, and then he concludes with, in the second and last sentence, he says, Adaku nana innam jnana vichara me mukhya sadhanam. For that jnana vichara, awareness investigation, alone, it's called who am I, alone is the principal means. That is, in order, in order to be happy, we need to know ourselves. And in order to know ourselves, we need to investigate ourselves. This term jnana vichara, it's a term that Bhagavan often uses, but the word jnana in this context means awareness. And the awareness he's referring to is the awareness that we actually are. So jnana vichara is another way of describing atma vichara. 
and he describes this vichara. He says, Nana in them, which is called who am I? That is what, what when we investigate the basic awareness that we actually are, what is what is that awareness that we're investigating? We, that in, awareness is what we experience as I. So we're seeking to know who or what am I? Um, and investigating that alone is the principal means for ourself to know ourself. Um, <clears throat> so we uh, we will not stop seeking infinite happiness until we experience it as our own real nature. And until we experience it thus, the nature of ourself as ego or mind is to continue seeking it in things other than ourself. So the mind will not cease roaming about the world until we see that we ourselves are the infinite and eternal happiness that we are always seeking. That is, why does the mind always seek happiness out? Why do we as mind always seek happiness outside ourselves? Why do we seek happiness in things other than ourselves? The reason is very simple. Because having risen as ego, we have now limited ourselves. So we've seemingly separated ourselves from the infinite happiness that we actually are. So the happiness we are craving now seems to us to be something other than ourselves. It seems to be something that we are lacking. Since we are lacking, where do we look for it? We look for it outside ourselves, not inside ourselves. Because when you feel you're lacking something, uh, you, you look for it um, outside the place where it seems to be absent. So since since sleep, see, sorry, since happiness seems to be uh, not present in ourselves, we seek the happiness outside ourselves. So this is the Maya we are all we are all caught up in. Um, so since Atmasrupa, the real nature of ourself, is what is called uh, Aranachala, what Bhagavan refers to in this verse as Un Arahe. Uh, uh, your beauty, meaning the beauty of Arunachala, is infinite happiness, which is the real nature of both Arunachala and of ourself, and which is the only real beauty. Only when the mind sees this real beauty that is Arunachala will it subside and thereby cease roaming about the world in search of happiness outside itself. That is, once the, once the mind finds the happiness that it is seeking is inside itself, why would it go outside itself? When it finds the full infinite ocean of happiness that lies within itself, it'll have no inclination to go out, outside again. Um, because having once seen this real beauty, the mind will be unable to let go of it. So it will continue to see it unceasingly and eternally. As Bhagavan implies when he sings, O Sutru Ulam Vidadu Unne Kandu Adangida Unnarahe Kartu Arunachala. Arunachala, so that seeing you uninterruptedly, the mind, which by its very nature roams incessantly about the world, subsides in you, show me your beauty. Um, Bidadu is a negative adverbial participle that means not leaving or not letting go. And it therefore implies uninterruptedly or incessantly. Uh, in this context, it applies both to the previous uh, clause, or uh, or sutru ulam, that the, the, mind, the, the, the world roaming mind, or the mind which roams about the world, because the nature of the mind is to roam incessantly about the world, so it applies to the, the roaming about the world. It also applies to unai kandu, seeing you, because when the mind once sees the real beauty that is Arunachala, it will be so enchanted and transfixed by that beauty that it will never be able to leave or let go of it. So it will continue eternally and uninterruptedly seeing or looking at Arunachala. Um, Aranatcha, as I say, means our own real nature. So the mind will be constantly looking within because that alone is where happiness is. And when the mind is constantly looking within, it thereby subsides in that. As Bhagavan, I'll explain that later on because that's what the, the a couple of words later, Adangida, that's what it implies. Um, 
so uh, this this term unne kandu, seeing you, the first word unne uh, is an accusative form of the second person singular pronoun you, and kandu is an adverbial participle that means uh, seeing or looking at. So unne kandu means seeing you or looking at you. Um, much like the, the Sanskrit word uh, darshanam, darshanam means seeing, but darshanam is often used in the sense of you go to a temple to have darshanam. So darshanam also has a, a connotation of, of worshipping. Likewise, um, a secondary meaning of kandu, which means seeing, is worshipping or adoring in the sense of gazing at with love and adoration. So in this context, uh, loving adoration is uh, implied in the phrase unne kandu, which therefore means looking at and seeing you in love and adoration. That is not the explicit meaning, but it's implicit in the word kandu. Um, because when we go to a temple, for example, to see the, the, the deity in the temple, that's called having darshan. But we, when we see that deity, we look up at, at it with love and adoration. So our mere looking at it is, a, is, a, is, is itself a worship. So, um, so that's what's implied by seeing you, that seeing you with, with a heart full of love. Because only when the heart is full of love for you, for Aranachala, will it see him uninterruptedly. Um, so as I say, unne kandu literally means seeing you, but it implies looking at or, um, or, or uh, and, and seeing you in love and adoration. This phrase unne kandu is further qualified by the negative adverbial participle vidadu, not leaving or not letting go. So vidadu unne kandu means seeing you without ever leaving or letting go of you. Um, because when Arunacha shows his beauty, we'll be so transformed fixed with wonder and love, but we will never again have even the slightest inclination to look away from him towards anything else whatsoever. That is what we are all seeking is infinite happiness. When we have found that infinite happiness, why will we go outside again looking for happy, iotas of happiness in the objects of the world? There would be no such inclination. Um, so, but this 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 phrase "unne kandu" seeing you has a very very deep meaning. So, it is worth thinking very carefully about the, the this this phrase "unne kandu," because it, it that is the, there are two simple words seeing you, but there's a wealth of meaning implied there. So, I'm now going to discuss what exactly Bhagavan implies when he talks about Unne Kandu. Um, uh, that's seeing you. Since Arunachala is our own real nature, seeing him is not a case of one thing seeing another thing, but of we ourselves seeing ourselves. In other words, the real nature of Arunachala cannot be seen or known as an object, but only as the reality of ourself, the subject. And we can see it only by being it, because it cannot be seen or known by anything other than itself. That is, Arunachala is pure awareness. How can pure awareness be known by anything other than pure awareness? Only pure awareness can know pure awareness. So it, pure awareness can never be an object of knowledge. It, in order to know pure awareness, we need to be pure awareness. So according to Bhagavan, the true seeing or true knowing is only being. So we can, we can know Aranachala or see Aranachala as it actually is only by being Aranachala. This is what Bhagavan implies in verse 26 of Upadesha India, in which he, the first sentence he says, Tanai iritale tanai aridalam. Uh, being oneself alone is uh, knowing oneself. Tani rendatradal, because oneself is devoid of two. 
That is, we are not two things. We are, we, we are not, we are not two eyes. One, one eye as a subject to know another eye as an object. No, there's only one eye. So we, we ourselves are one. And because we are one, we can know ourselves only by being ourselves. And, and he concludes this verse by saying, Tanmaya, uh, Tanmaya Nishte Idundi Para. That means this is Tanmaya Nishta. Tanmaya means of the nature of that. That refers to uh, Brahman. Uh, so this is abiding as Brahman is an um, um, implication. So if we expand the meaning of this verse slightly, being oneself, that is being as one actually is without rising to know anything else, alone is knowing oneself. Because oneself, in the sense of one's own real nature, ourself as we actually are, is devoid of two. That is, it's devoid of the fundamental duality of subject and object, knower and thing known and also devoid of any possibility of being divided as two selves, one self as a subject to know the other self as an object. Um, why can we know ourselves as we actually are only by being ourselves as we actually are? And why is knowing ourselves as we actually are alone seeing Arunacha as he actually is? Bhagavan explains this or makes this clear in the previous three verses of Upadesha India, what we actually are is pure awareness, uh, for which the Tamil word is Unavu, the Sanskrit equivalent is Chit, which alone is what actually exists, for which the Tamil word is Ulladu, and the Sanskrit equivalent is Sat. So this is what Bhagavan explains in verse 23, the first of the three previous verses. Um, the, that is the three verses prior to verse 26 of Upadesha India. Um, what he says in this verse, it's a, it's a very simple, but, a, uh, he, but the argument he gives here, if we think about it deeply, it's a very simple but powerful argument he, he gives here for the oneness of existence and awareness. Existence and awareness cannot be two separate things. The reason being, as he says, the, the, the plain meaning of the verse without any expansion is because of the non-existence of other awareness, to be aware of what exists, what exists is awareness. Awareness alone exists as we. Why does he say because of the, exist the non-existence of other awareness? What do you mean by other awareness? What he means is awareness other than what exists. Anything that is other than what exists does not exist. Uh, by definition. So it, it, any awareness other than what exists, it would be a non-existent awareness. There's no such thing. So awareness cannot be other than what exists. So what exists alone is awareness. So it's a, it's a very, very simple but powerful argument Bhagavan gives us there. And what is that awareness he's talking about? It's not some something that we can know as an object. It is we ourselves for that. So he concludes the verse by saying, Unave na mai ulam. Awareness alone exists as we. Here the awareness he's talking about is pure awareness. The awareness that knows nothing other than itself, nothing other than its own existence. And that pure awareness alone is what actually exists. And that alone is what we actually are. Um, pure awareness knows itself just by being itself. And since it alone is Uludu, uh, which means what actually exists, there is nothing other than itself for it to know. There is never a moment when it does not know itself, nor any moment when it knows anything other than itself. So it is eternal and immutable. Um, since it alone is what we actually are, we can know ourselves as we actually are only by being as it is, as Bhagavan implies in the first Mangalam verse of Uludunapadu. Um, this is a, a very beautiful verse, um, but I won't go into it too in too much detail now because they've got a lot to cover. What, what the basic meaning of the verse is, if Uludu, what exists, were not, would existing awareness exist? And that sentence actually can be interpreted in several different ways. It can also mean, except as Uladu, 
does uh, existing awareness exist? And the term ulla unavu, existing awareness, that means the actual awareness, the awareness that actually exists. Another, it can, this can also be interpreted to mean aware, that is, ulla is also the infinitive of another verb, but means ul, ullu, which means to think. So it can also mean other than ulladu, is there awareness to think of it? Um, so this first sentence has various different meanings, but and then the, the second sentence is, uh, since the existing substance exists in the heart without thought, how to think of the existing substance, which is called the heart? That is, the, the existing substance, what he refers to here as Ulla Porul, is the same as Ulla do, what actually exists. And since it exists in the heart, that means within ourselves, as our own reality, it implies, and it exists without thought, it's beyond the range of thought. So how to think of, of, of that, that which is beyond the range of thought? And he also says uh, that existing substance which is called the heart, ulla menum, ulla porol. Ulla menum means which is called the heart. Um, ullam can also mean, um, again, it's, uh, I'd have to explain some, some, uh, Tamil grammar, but ullam can also be, uh, mean are, as in, uh, the first person plural, we are. Um, but Bhagavan often uses the, the plural form of the first person pronoun, not because there's more than one of us, but because to to make it inclusive. When he's talking to us, he doesn't exclude us, he includes us, and he includes himself. So he uses an inclusive form. So um what he what that uh meaning of are implies am. So another meaning of ullam in this context, the existing substance, which is called am. Am in the sense of I am. Um so he asks a question, how, since it's beyond thought, how to think of it? And he's, then he answers that question. That literally means being in the heart as it is alone is thinking. What that implies is, but being as we actually are, alone is meditating what, on what we actually are which is what alone actually exists. So we can, we can know what, what actually exists is pure awareness. And we can know that pure awareness only by being as it is, by remaining as pure awareness. That is the implication here. So in order to know pure awareness, we need to be as it is. We need to remain as pure awareness without rising as ego. Um. Ulladu means what is or what exists, but particularly in the sense of what actually exists. We don't use Ulladu to refer to those things that merely seem to exist, but only to what actually exists. So Ulladu means what exists in the sense of what actually exists, as opposed to what merely seems to exist. This whole world seems to exist when we, uh, when we see it, but it doesn't actually exist. It merely seems to exist. So it, it is not what is meant by the word Ulladu. Ulladu refers to that which actually exists. Likewise, Ullaporul, which means the existing substance or the substance that exists. This Tamil word Porul is equivalent to the Sanskrit word Vastu, which means substance, but in the sense of the real substance, the only, the only existing reality. So it's it's referring to our true nature, our, our what we essentially are, uh, in our word Brahman. So um, uh, so Ullaporul, the existing substance, means the substance that actually exists, as opposed to any substance that merely seems to exist. That, for example, there are so many material substances. Gold is a material substance, but it can be formed into so many different rings. Well, uh, sorry, so many different ornaments. Whatever ornament it's formed, it's it's formed into the substance remains the same. Uh, so the substance is always more real, more enduring 
from the form. But even these material substances themselves are forms. The ultimate substance is only the, this Ulla Poro, the, the substance that actually exists. All other substances are merely, see, are mere, see, merely see, see, they're seemingly substances, but they're not real substances. But the, the word substance actually is quite a beautiful word. It means what stands under. So what is the ultimate base, the ultimate ground on which everything rests is this Ulla Porol or Ulla Du. And what is that? As Bhagavan says, that is pure awareness. Um, uh, since Ulla Du is what exists, there cannot be anything other than it, because anything other than what exists would by definition be non-existent. So there cannot be anything other than Ulla Du. Therefore, since there cannot be any awareness, Unavu or Chit, other than what exists, Uludu or Sat, what exists cannot be known by any awareness other than itself. So it is itself the awareness, but knows itself. As Bhagavan points out in verse 23 of Upadesh India, which we discussed earlier. And just as awareness could not be anything other than what exists, what exists could not be anything other than awareness, because anything other than awareness does not know its own existence. So it exists, or rather seems to exist, only in the view of whatever awareness knows its seeming existence. This is why Bhagavan often used to say one of the definitions of reality or of real existence is self-shining. Whatever doesn't shine by its own light doesn't actually exist because it appears only in the view of something else. So this whole world doesn't shine by its own light. It shines only by the light of the mind. So it's only uh, 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 in the view of the mind that the world seems to exist. So the world depends for its semi existence upon the semi existence of ourself as this mind or ego. And even ego doesn't exist by its own light because it appears and disappears. So it's not a real existence. It borrows its light of awareness from our real nature, from Satchit. So the, the real awareness, sorry, real, what actually exists, it has to be aware of its own existence. If it, if it wasn't aware of its own existence, it would appear only in the view of something else, namely ego, so it would be a dependent existence. So real existence must be awareness. Anything that exists only in the view of some awareness other than itself does not actually exist because its existence or semi-existence depends on the existence of whatever awareness knows it. So it does not exist independently. Its existence is therefore not a real existence, but just a semi-existence. What actually exists is what is actually aware, and what is actually aware is what actually exists. In other words, existence, sat, and awareness are one and inseparable. Therefore, as Bhagavan says in conclusion to the first sentence of verse 23 of Upadesha Undia, um, Oh, oh, oh yes, he says, Ulladu unabahum. What exists is awareness. That is, awareness is what actually exists, and nothing other than awareness exists at all. Anything other than awareness merely seems to exist, but it does not actually exist. All other things seem to exist only in the view of ourself as ego. And ego itself does not actually exist because it appears only in waking and dream, but disappears in sleep. This is another definition Bhagavan gave of reality. Uh, that is, Bhagavan often used to say, in order to be real, something must be eternal. It must be always. If it exists at one time and not at another time, that means it doesn't actually exist, even when it seems to exist. So it must be eternal. It must be unchanging. Because anything that is changing is one thing at one time and another thing at another time. And it must be self-shining. So ego, though it seems to shine by its own light, it doesn't actually shine by its own light. Why? Because it is not eternal. It appears and it disappears. So we are aware both of the states in which ego seems to exist, namely waking and dream, 
and of another state in which it does not seem to exist, namely sleep. So we are the light of awareness that illumines ego, enabling ego to illumine the whole world. So the awareness that actually exists is pure awareness, which is aware of nothing other than its own existence. Um, uh, oh, sorry, no, I jumped ahead a bit. Um, uh, anything other than awareness merely seems to exist, but does not actually exist. All other th things seem to exist only in the view of ego. Oh, oh yeah, this is what I was, uh, where I was, which itself does not actually exist because it appears in waking and dream, but disappears in sleep. Anything that appears and disappears does not actually exist, even when it seems to exist because what actually exists must always exist and therefore can never cease to exist. That is anything that uh, but seems to exist at one time and not at another time is not intrinsically existent. If it was intrinsically existent, it could never cease to exist. So, it's, so whatever seems to exist at one time and not at another time, as Bhagavan said, does not actually exist even when it seems to exist. Ego seems to exist and to be aware of other things only because it is illumined by its own reality, namely the one real consciousness, which alone is what actually exists. Uh, um, the awareness that actually exists is pure awareness, which is aware of nothing other than its own existence, I am. So it alone is the reality of ego, the false awareness that is always aware of itself, not just as I am, but as I am this body, I am this person, I'm a certain person, I'm, I'm Michael or John or Mary or, or whatever. We, we identify, when we identify ourselves as a body, the body seems to have, it's given a name, and so we identify ourselves with that name. The name refers to the body, to the person we seem to be. That is not what we actually are. What we actually are is only I am. I am in its pure condition. Um. So uh, <clears throat> um, without the real awareness I am, which is what we actually are, the false awareness I am this body, namely ego, could not seem to exist. When Bhagavan says in the final sentence of verse 23 of Upadesha Undia, Unave namai ullam, awareness alone exists as we, what he means by nam, we, is not ourself as ego, but only ourself as we actually are, namely the fundamental awareness I am, which is the sole reality underlying the semi existence of ego, just as the rope is the reality underlying the semi existence of an illusory snake. <clears throat> Since what exists is awareness, it does not exist as an object. Uh, and therefore cannot be known as an object. So it does not exist outside ourself, but only in the innermost depth of our heart, beyond the range of thought. As Bhagavan points out in the first clause of the second sentence of the first Mangalam verse of Uludunapti, which we discussed earlier, since the existing substance exists in the heart without thought. So since he's, that's the reason why he says that. Um, how then can we think of it or meditate upon it, investigate it or know it? Only by just being as it is. As he says in the third sentence, Ullate, Ullapadi, Ullade, Ullal. Being in the heart as it is alone is thinking of it. Here, thinking, okay, okay I'll, I'll go, go on. The, the word for thinking is Ullal. Ullal means thinking, remembering, meditating or investigating. But we obviously cannot literally think of or meditate on that which is beyond the range of thought. Um, if we try to think of it, what we are actually thinking of is only an idea of it. For, for instance, some people uh, say God is formless, so I will meditate only on a formless God. What they are meditating on is not the formless God, they're just meditating on the idea of a formless God. But every idea is just a mental form. So we cannot meditate upon God as formless until we know ourselves as formless. That's why Bhagavan said, being as it is, 
alone is is meditating on it or knowing it. Um, uh, um, if we try to think of it, what we're actually thinking of is only an idea of it and not it as it actually is. Therefore, when Bhagavan says, but being in the heart as it is, alone is thinking of it, he's using the term ulla, thinking, in a metaphorical sense, because it's beyond thought, we can't actually think of it. What he implies by saying thinking in this context uh, is, is that being in the heart is alone knowing it as it actually is. So Bhagavan often uh, uses metaphorical language because metaphorical language is often the best way to describe that which is beyond thoughts and words. That is, we cannot conceive these things adequately with our mind, so they cannot be adequately expressed in words. But sometimes the metaphorical language points out to what we are trying to say, trying to, what is what what we what Bhagavan is trying to point out something to us which is beyond uh, words, beyond thoughts. So he uses metaphors to draw our attention to what cannot be adequately expressed in words. Um, so when he says being in the heart as it is, alone is thinking, that is not thinking, that is just being. So thinking there means knowing it as it is. So in order to know it as it is, we need to be it as it is. We need to be as it is. Um, and the heart uh, that he refers to is not just the place where Ullaporul, the existing substance, exists, but is Ullaporul itself. That is, the heart is the existing substance. As he indicates by saying, Ullamenum Ullaporul, uh, Ulla Levan, that in the second end of the second sentence, main clause of the second sentence, he says, uh, how to or who can think of Ulla Porul, which is called Ullam, the heart. Since Ulla Porul, the existing substance, is our self as we actually are, Ulla Te, Ulla Padi, Ulla De, only being in the heart as it is, means being as we actually are, namely as pure awareness which is devoid of thought. Therefore, uh, since pure awareness is awareness that is aware of nothing other than its own being, I am, we can know, we can be as it is only by being so keenly self-attentive that we cease to be aware of anything other than our own being, I am. That is, when we turn our attention back towards ourselves. The more keenly we focus our attention on ourselves, the more our attention is withdrawn from other things. When we when we attend to ourselves so keenly that we cease to be aware of anything other than ourselves, that is the state of pure awareness. And being aware of ourselves as pure awareness alone will destroy ego. That is, we seem to be ego only so long as we know ourselves as anything other than pure awareness. When we know ourselves with pure awareness, ego is thereby uh, annihilated, eradicated, finished. So mano nasa can be attained only by knowing ourselves with pure awareness. That is, we as ego need to know ourselves with pure awareness. But ego can never know itself with pure awareness because as soon as it knows itself with pure awareness, it ceases to be ego and remains with pure awareness. This is what Bhagavan is saying here. So this is why this, when we are practicing self-investigation, we are not merely, many people think we just have to withdraw our attention from other things. But if we withdraw our attention from other things without focusing it on ourselves, the mind will subside in layer in Nivikalpa Samadhi or a state like sleep, which is of no use to us. We, we want to bring about not merely mano layer, which is a temporary dissolution of mind, but mano nas of a permanent dissolution of mind. And that permanent dissolution of mind cannot be brought about by merely withdrawing our attention from other things. It needs to be brought about by focusing our attention on ourself alone. In yoga and so many other paths, they're trying to that is yoga's chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is is, uh, is trying to stop or curb the men activity of the mind. But by stopping the activity of the mind, we merely fall in uh, subside in layer. Every night when we fall asleep, we stop the activity of the mind, 
and we remain in layer. But we don't progress. We are, we are not more spiritually developed the next morning when we wake up. We wake up with the same old vasanas. So vasanas are not destroyed in uh, in manolaya. So being in manolaya is of no spiritual benefit at all. So we what we need is to withdraw our attention from other things by attending to ourselves. If we're not attending to ourselves, merely withdrawing our attention from other things will result in layer. So our, our, when we are investigating ourselves, we shouldn't even be concerned about withdrawing our attention from other things. We are not to be concerned about other things at all. We are only to be concerned about attending to ourselves. If we attend to ourselves, our attention is automatically withdrawn from other things without our even noticing it. That's why Bhagavan says in the sixth paragraph of Nana, Etene Enangal Erinomena, however many thoughts arise, so what? Why he says that? Because we shouldn't be concerned about the appearance or disappearance of thoughts. Let any number of thoughts come. So what? Big deal. We are not interested in thoughts. We are interested in knowing who am I. If we want to know who am I, we have to focus our attention on ourselves. Because we have focused our attention on ourselves, it's thereby withdrawn from thoughts. So the thoughts cannot exist unless we attend to them. But if we begin to think, oh, have all the thoughts disappeared yet? Again, our mind is going out towards the thoughts. So we, we need to be totally unconcerned about thoughts. We should be concerned only about attending to ourselves. Um, so all that I've discussed here, how did this help us to understand the deep implication of the clause, vidadu unne kandu, seeing you without ever leaving or letting go of you? Unne kandu, seeing you, means seeing Arunachala. And Arunachala is God, what, who is what we actually are, as Bhagavan explains in verse 24 of Upadesh Undia. That is, I said in the previous four verses, 23, 24, 25, Bhagavan explains why he says in verse 26, but being, uh, being ourself alone is knowing ourself. So it's um, continuing on that line. But this is all to explain the uh, deep significance of what Bhagavan means by unne kandu, seeing you, seeing Arunachala. Um, what, what he says in verse 24 of Upadesha Undia is, irakum ekeal isa jivagal oru porale arva undipara upadi unavei ber undipara. What that means is, by existing nature, God and soul are just one substance. Only adjunct awareness is different. What he means by existing nature, uh, uh, is the real nature of both our nature and ourself, which is pure being, so and also pure awareness, of course. So this is what he refers to in the first Mangalam verse of Uladunapdu as Uladu, what exists, and as Ullaporul. Uh, the existing substance or substance that exists. In other words, our irakumiyake or existing nature is what we actually are. So this alone is what Bhagavan describes as oruporal, or oruporal, the uh, one substance. So when he says by existing nature, God and uh, soul are one substance, but what is that one substance? It is the existing nature of both God and soul. So it's a very uh, carefully and, and tightly constructed sentence. He packed a, so much meaning into that. Um, so, uh, in other words, um, uh, so and and that once yeah, so the irakumiya kal is what it, it sorry the irakumiya k uh, existing nature existing or being nature is the one substance which he says is both the uh, both God and soul isa and jiva. Therefore, since Arunachala is what he refers to here as Isa or God, we and we are what he refers to as Jiva or soul, that means we as ego are what he refers to as ego or soul, what he implies here is that our real nature as pure being, I am, is the one real substance which is both, which is what both Arunachala and our self actually are. 
why then do we seem to be something other than the one existing substance, Ulaparul, which is Aranachala? In other words, why are we not aware of ourselves as Aranachala? If Aranachala is what we actually are, why are we not aware of ourselves as such? The answer is, uh, to this is provided by Bhagavan in the second sentence of this verse, Upadi Unavei. Only adjunct awareness is different. That is, when we rise as ego or jiva, we cease to be aware of ourselves as just I am, which is our irakumiyake, our existing nature, and instead we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, which is our rising nature. Um, the body, which is a form consisting of five she's, namely uh, the physical body, life, mind, intellect, and will, is an adjunct, upadi. So our awareness of ourselves as I am this body is what he refers to here as upadi unavu, adjunct awareness. Since we mistake ourselves to be one set of adjuncts, we take our nature to be another set of adjuncts. That is, since we've limited ourselves with this person, we cannot conceive of God or Aranachala, whatever conception we have of God or Aranachala is a necessary a limited conception, because the limited jiva cannot have an unlimited conception of God. So w- even if we have an idea God is infinite, that is just an idea. That we, we are not actually experiencing the infinite nature of God until we experience our own infinite nature, because the infinite nature of God is our own infinite nature. Um, because there can't be more than two infinites. Any, if something is infinite, nothing can be other than that. So that is what we actually are. So when when we mistake ourselves to be one set of adjuncts, we take our natural to be another set of adjuncts. That is why Bhagavan often used to say, so long as we take ourselves to be a form, we cannot know God as formless. For example, in verse 4 of Uludunapadu, he says, um, Uruvam tanayin uruhu paramatran. If oneself is a form, world and God will be likewise. And then he goes on to say, if oneself is not a form, who can see their forms and how? In other words, the, the world seems to be a, a, a multitude of names and forms, and God seems to be a name and form, only because we take ourselves to be a name and form. If we know ourselves as the formless, infinite I am, we will know God is nothing other than that, and we will also know the world is nothing other than that. Um so it's in that sense that Bhagavan says, sometimes says, I mean, Bhagavan generally said the world is unreal. Sometimes he says the world is real. What does he mean when he said the world is real? The world as world is unreal. But the world as, as it actually is, namely as pure awareness, is real. That's like saying the, the snake as a snake is unreal. The snake as a rope is real. Um, so what the... the the world has no existence independent of the infinite being, which is our own real nature, and that alone is real. Um, but so long as we take ourselves to be one set of adjuncts, we take God or our natural to be another set of adjuncts. But since he is never aware of himself as anything other than pure being awareness, such it, he is never aware of any adjuncts at all. Therefore, the adjunct awareness, what Bhagavan refers to as uh, upadi unavu exists only in the view of ego, not in the view of God. He therefore never sees anything other than himself. So if we are to see him as he actually is, which is as he sees himself, all we need to do is to see ourselves without adjuncts, as Bhagavan says in verse 25 of Upadeshundiya. What he says in this verse is, um, tane upadi vittu, Ovadu tan isan tane unavadam. Knowing oneself, leaving aside adjuncts, that means knowing oneself without adjuncts, alone is itself knowing God. Why? Tanai olivadal, because of shining as oneself. That means because God shines as ourself, because God is what we actually are, He's shining in our heart as pure awareness, which is what we actually are. We we can know him only by knowing ourselves without adjuncts. 
So we we need to what God is is the pure I am. In order to know the pure I am, we need to know ourselves without the adjuncts. When we remove the adjuncts, what remains is the pure I am. The ad, in the in the in the adjunct completed awareness, I am this body. This body is the adjunct. The basic awareness, the fundamental awareness is I am. That is the awareness of our own being. That is our natural. That is God. That is Brahman. That is what we actually are. Um, uh, when we rise and stand as ego, we are always aware of ourselves as a set of adjuncts, namely a body consisting of five sheaths. So, Tane Upadi Vittu or Vidu, knowing oneself leaving aside adjuncts, means knowing ourselves as we actually are and thereby ceasing to rise as ego. Therefore, what Bhagavan implies in this verse is that we cannot know God as he actually is without knowing ourselves as we actually are, because he is what we actually are. And we cannot know ourselves as we actually are without ceasing to rise as ego, because whenever we rise as ego, we know ourselves as a set of adjuncts. I am this body, which is not what we actually are. So, uh, in other words, when we when we know ourselves as without adjuncts, we remain as the pure awareness I am. That is why he says in the next verse, verse 26, being oneself alone is knowing oneself. Um, so because we cannot um we cannot know ourselves as we actually are without thereby ceasing to rise as ego. This is why he says in the in the eighth verse of Acts Ramlai, the verse we're talking about today, Ulam Bidadu Unne Kandu Adangida. That means so that seeing you inter uninterruptedly, the mind subsides. So, but the word Adangida, um, Oh, okay, I'll, I'll explain that. Adangida is the infinite form of uh, Adangidu, which is a compound of two verbs. Adangu, which means to yield, submit, be subdued, shrink, settle, subside, cease, or disappear. And idu, which in this context serves as an auxiliary verb, but intensifies whatever verb it's appended to. So adangida means to subside, settle, submit, or cease entirely. So he, the only when the mind sees Aranatra as he actually is, and when it sees it as he actually is, sees him as he actually is, it will see him vidadu, unceasingly, without ever leaving him. Only then will it subside in such a way that it will never rise again. Um, uh, here the infinitive is used in the sense of in order to or so that. So, um, Ulum Adangida means in order for the mind to subside or so that the mind subsides, settles, submits, ceases uh, uh, entirely and forever. Aranatra is Atmosarupa, the real nature of ourself, whereas the mind is what we seem to be so long as we attend to anything other than ourself. When we rise as mind, we're aware of ourselves as I am this body, and we're consequently aware of other things. So the mind is a false awareness of ourself, and hence it will cease to exist only when we're aware of ourselves as we actually are. Uh, in other words, in order to make the mind subside in such a way that it will never rise again, we need to see ourselves as we actually are. And seeing ourselves as we actually are is what Bhagavan refers to here as unne kandu, seeing you. Because unne, uh, you, here refers to Aranachala, who is ourself as we actually are. In this context, uh, unne kandu, seeing you, does not mean seeing Aranachala in name and form. Because the nature of ego or mind is to rise, stand and flourish by attending to forms, but to subside and dissolve back into its source only by attending to itself, as Bhagavan implies in verse 25 of Uladunapadu. This is the verse in which he refers to ego as a formless phantom or an evil spirit. And he says, it for, when he says it's formless, he means it has no form of its own. 
So how does this formless phantom seem to exist? A phantom is something with no substance. Of something that is formless has no form, so it has neither form nor substance. How does this ego seem to exist? It, it, ego doesn't have any substance of its own, but the, the substance that it borrows is the uh, is such it, Bill, a fundamental existence awareness. I am. So that's its substance, and its the form is whatever body it takes to be itself. But it has, but it's formless because that no form belongs to it, and it's a, a phantom because the substance that it borrows from Satchit doesn't belong to it. So how does it uh, come into existence, stand and flourish? Bhagavan explains in the earlier part of the verse. Grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it grows abundantly. Leaving form, it grasps form. So the very nature of the mind is to be constantly grasping form. And so long as it is grasping form, it is feeding on form. It is nourishing itself. And so it grows big and fat and strong. This is why ego tends to be so um, assertive because it's constantly feeding itself on forms. I, uh, I am this. I am such and such an important person. This is my property. This is mine. And so we, all this I am mine makes ego so strong. But it, what it takes as I am mine is things other than itself forms. It doesn't know itself as it actually is. If instead of trying to grasp forms, if ego tries to grasp itself, what happens? Since it can since it cannot come into existence, stand or flourish without grasping form, and since it, it, it itself is formless, if it tries to grasp itself, what will happen? That's what Bhagavan explains in the next sentence. Tedinal otumpidicum. If sought, it will take flight. That means if ego seeks itself, if it tries to hold on to itself to see who am I, it will take flight. That means it'll run away. It'll disappear. It'll, it'll subside and dissolve back into its source. Um, so, since ego will not subside until it until it attends to itself, when Bhagavan says, uh, uh, unne, unne kandu adangida, uh, meaning the mind uh, uh, subsiding, uh, Unne kandu doesn't mean seeing a name and form, because so long as we're seeing a name and form, we are ego. So it's, uh, 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 what, when Bhagavan talks about uh, seeing you uninterruptedly uh, uh, so that the mind subsides, he doesn't mean seeing you in name and form. He means seeing you as, you actually, as it actually is. However, this does not mean that there's no benefit in seeing the name or form of Arunachala, because the name and form of Arunachala have a special power to turn our attention back within to see what we actually are, which alone is his real form, Swarupa. Nevertheless, the mind will not subside in such a way that it will never rise again until we turn back within away from all names and forms, to see him as he actually is, namely as Atmosvarupa, the real nature of ourself. Moreover, there's another reason why we can conclude that Bhagavan is not referring here to seeing Aranacha in name and form. That is, he says, Vidadu une kandu, seeing you without ever leaving or letting go of you. That doesn't mean seeing him in name and form, because what sees names and forms is only ego, which rises in waking and dream, but subsides in sleep. So even if we as ego could see his name or form uninterruptedly in the waking and dream states, it, it, we would still leave his name and form when we fall asleep. Seeing Aaron actually in name and form is therefore not seeing him in reality, as Bhagavan implies in verse 8 of Uludunapadu. Um, what he says in verse 8 is, whoever worships in whatever form, giving whatever name, that is the way to see that poral, that substance, in name and form. Uh, however, investigating the reality of oneself, dissolving in the reality, and thereby dissolving in the reality of that true substance and becoming one with it, is seeing in reality. 
So here he's contrasting. In the first sentence, how to see God in name and form? Worship him in name and form, then you'll see him in name and form. If you want to see him as he, in reality, that means as he really is, you need to investigate the reality of yourself, thereby dissolving his reality, which is the reality of yourself, and become one with him. That alone is seeing him in reality. Since Arunacha alone is the one real substance, may poral or sat vastu, it is what Bhagavan refers to in this verse as tanun may, the reality of oneself. So seeing the reality of oneself by investigating what we actually are, alone is seeing him in reality. Since all names and forms are mental fabrications, instead of seeing him as the reality of ourself, Seeing him in name and form is not seeing him as he actually is, but is only seeing a mental image, as Bhagavan says in verse 20 of Uludunapadu. What he says in verse 20 is, leaving oneself, or, or that in, in this context, leaving or letting go of oneself. In other words, not attending to oneself who sees. Oneself seeing God is seeing a mental image vision, a mental image. Uh, the word term he uses in Tamil is manamaya mam kakshi. Mana, manamaya means mental or what is constituted of the mind, and kakshi means what is seen or uh, an image or a phenomenon or a, an appearance. Um, uh, so it's vision in the sense of what is seen. Um, so if we see God in name and form, the name and form we are seeing is just a, men it's just a mental fabrication, is the implication. And then he goes on, then the next part of this verse is Bhagavan expresses very, very, um, in a very terse manner. It takes a little bit of interpretation to understand what Bhagavan is saying. I'll read it very literally and um, then explain a little bit more. Bhagavan says, only one who sees oneself, the origin of oneself, is one who has seen God, because the origin, oneself, going, oneself is not other than God. Uh, what he means by that is, only one who sees oneself, that means one's real nature, which is the origin or the base or foundation of oneself, namely ego, is one who has seen God. Because oneself, one's real nature, which alone is what remains when oneself, namely ego, the origin, root or foundation of all other things goes, is not other than God. Um, so that, that's a sentence to understand the deep significance of what Bhagavan is saying here. This is a sentence we need to think about very, very carefully and un to understand what it is Bhagavan is saying here. It's such a, it has such a deep meaning. Since ego is a false awareness of ourself, mm -hmm. an awareness of ourself is something other than what we actually are, so long as we rise and stand as ego, we cannot see ourselves as we actually are, and hence we cannot see Arunacha as he actually is, because he is what we actually are. Therefore, as soon as we see ourselves as we actually are, ego will subside in such a way that it will never rise again. So Bhagavan concludes verse 21 of Uludhanapadu by saying, Unadal Khan, becoming food is seeing, thereby implying that eradication of ego alone is seeing Arunachala. That is what he, Bhagavan says in verse 21 of Uludhanapadu is, if one asks what is the truth of many texts that say, seeing oneself and seeing God, that is so many, so many, um, spiritual texts, they talk about seeing oneself and they also talk about seeing God. Um, some people have misinterpreted this verse, but seeing oneself is seeing God. That is true, but that's not what Bhagavan is saying here. He's talking about two separate things. That is, some texts say but we must see ourselves. Other texts say we must see God. So what is the truth of all these texts? Let's first consider about seeing ourselves. Can we see ourselves? But one says, since oneself is one, how is oneself to see oneself? And then he says, if it is not possible to see, that means if it's not possible for oneself to see oneself, how to see God? And then he answered both these questions by saying, Unadal Khan, becoming food is seeing. 
That is, we we cannot see ourselves as an object. So we can see ourselves just by being ourselves. But being ourselves means being as we actually are. In order to be as we actually are, ego needs to be swallowed. So that is what he means by becoming food. So who is to swallow us? God is to swallow us. If God swallows us, we then remain as God alone. That is, if God swallows ego, what remains is God alone. And God is our own real nature. So that is what we actually are. So we can we can know ourselves and know God only by becoming food to him. In other words, only by, by being swallowed by him. So ego needs to become food, and then we remain as we actually are. Seeing ourselves bereft of adjuncts alone is seeing our nature as he actually is. And seeing ourself mixed and complete, and since ego is ourself mixed and complete with adjuncts, it is eradicated as soon as we see ourselves bereft of adjuncts. So when we as ego have been swallowed by our so only when we as ego have been swallowed by our natural are we truly seeing him. This is what Bhagavan implies by saying, Unadal Khan, becoming food is seeing in this verse, and also what he implies in this eighth verse of Aksharamlai when he says, Ulam Vidadu Unne Kandu Adangida. So that seeing you in- uninterruptedly, the mind subsides. That is, when we see our nature uninterruptedly, we thereby become in food for him, or we subside that we subside in him as him. And he alone that remains as our own real nature. The mind cannot see uh, Arunachala as he really is without subsiding in him so thoroughly that it can never rise again. So who is it who sees him uninterruptedly? Bhagavan says, see you uninterruptedly. But if the mind is subsided, then who is to see him uninterruptedly? He alone sees himself because he can never be an object of sight or awareness, so he can never be seen by anything other than himself. Therefore, we can see him only by being him, and we can be him only by being swallowed by him. So Unadal Khan, becoming food to him, alone is seeing him as he actually is. Unadal Khan simply means becoming food is seeing what it implies is becoming food to him is alone seeing him as he actually is. Um, subsiding in such a way that we become food to our natural and therefore never rise again is what Bhagavan refers to as en- aritu, destroying me or annihilating me. Uh, these are the begin- opening words of the next verse, verse 9 of Akshramlai, what Bhagavan says is, Ene aritu, uh, destroying me. The whole bold verse is, Ene uh, aritu, uh, Arunachala, if not now uniting me, destroying me, is this your manliness? That, as always in Akram, Bhagavan puts it very, in a very compact way, so we have to slightly expand it to get the meaning. Um, when he says, if not now uniting me, he means, if you, if you do not unite me with yourself in inseparable oneness, and why does he say ipodu now? Now means now that I'm willing to surrender myself entirely to you. That is, you have brought me to you. I am ready to give myself entirely to you. So if you do not unite yourself with me, uh, destroying me, is this your manliness? That is, this is the, here again, Bhagavan is bringing him the Nayaki Nayaki Baba. That is, Arunacha has brought us to him in order to unite us with him. When he, when he unites us with him, that is destroying us. Uh, the illusion is to destroying virginity. When the, when, when the union takes place, the virginity is destroyed. The virginity in this case is ego. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't unite with us, uh, destroying us, swallowing us entirely, is this his manliness? Um, uh, s- since Arunachala is not an object of perception and can therefore never be seen as such, we can see him only by being him. 
and we can be him only when he destroys us and thereby makes us one with himself. That is the implication of this verse. And that is the ma his manliness. His manliness here means his grace. Uh, his grace is to swallow us. If he doesn't swallow us, then where is his manliness? Where is his grace? Um, so long as we rise and stand as ego, we seem to be separate from him, and hence we cannot see him as he actually is. So in order for us to see him as he sees himself, our separate existence as ego needs to be eradicated. And this eradication of ego is what he refers to in verse 8, as ulam adangida, for the mind to subside or cease, or so that the mind subsides or ceases, and in verse 9, as ene aritu, destroying me. Only when ego is thus destroyed will we be united with our natural in our natural and eternal state of inseparable oneness with him. And only when we are one with him are we seeing him as he actually is. We can therefore uh, see him only by surrendering ourselves to him entirely. And we'll be willing to surrender ourselves to him entirely only when we have all-consuming love for him. Such all-consuming love is our real nature. But so long as we rise and stand as ego, we seem to lack such love. And hence our mind wanders ceaselessly around the world, seeking happiness in, in things other than ourselves. We will therefore cease wandering out about outside and surrender ourselves entirely to him only when he attracts us to him in such a way that we are consumed entirely by intense love for him. We wander about among the vishayas, objects or phenomena that constitute the world, because in our clouded and befuddled state of self-ignorance, we're under the wrong impression that we can obtain happiness from them. And hence, we, const we are constantly swayed this way and that way uh, by, by our Vishaya Vasanas, our inclinations to seek happiness in those Vishayas. Therefore, it is only when our nature makes us see what it makes us see that happiness is our own real nature, but we will be willing to look within to see so keenly that we will thereby cease seeing anything else and see him alone as our own real nature. This is therefore what Bhagavan teaches us to pray for in this verse. Our natural making us see that happiness is our own real nature is what he implies by praying, un arahe kartu. Arunachala. Arunachala, show your beauty. Un is the inflectional base of the second person singular pronoun. And when used on its own, it represents the genitive case. So it means your. Arahe is the accusative form of arahu, which means beauty. And kartu is a, is a transitive verb that means show, disclose, reveal, or cause to see. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's the causative form of Khan, which means to see. That the word, word, word we were seeing earlier, Kandu, uh, Unne Kandu, seeing you, that Kandu is a, is a, is an adverbial participle formed from the verb Khan. Khan means to see. The causative form of Khan is Kartu, cause to see or show. So, Unnarahe Kartu, means show your beauty or more more specifically make me see your beauty you have to make me see so long as i'm looking outside i can't see your beauty so you have to make my mind turn back within to see your real beauty what bhagavan means by unarahu your beauty is clearly and beautifully described by Murugana. Um, I've actually, uh, in the article I wrote on this verse, I actually quoted what Murugan has said because it's so beautifully expressed. What he says is, Un, um, uh, well, I'll just read the meaning. Anyone who wants to see exactly what Murugan says in Tamil, they can refer to my commentary or to the book with his commentary in it. Um, what it what the meaning of what, uh, what Murugan says is, what is called your beauty is Arunachala Swarupa Lavanya. Swarupa Lavanya means the beauty, loveliness, or charm of his real nature. And what is, the, what is his real nature? Which is 
Sudha Chaitanya, pure awareness. And what is the nature of that pure awareness? Which exists and shines without two parties, Nirupadika, being a Swayam Jyoti, self luminous, and Nirvikalpa, devoid of change or differences, and which is uh, uh, Vyati Reka, antithetical to all Vishayas, objects or phenomena, which delude the mind, appearing as Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya. Um, it's, it's, he packs a lot into this very short uh, sentence, but, um, but one of the key words in this sentence is Vyati Rekam. Uh, this is actually a Sanskrit word. It means what is distinct from and can never coexist with. And it, it therefore means what excludes or negates entirely. So, Vishayangalaku Elam, Vyadi Rekamana, means which is Vyadi Reka to all Vishayas. Um, this is a relative clause referring to Sudya Chaitanya, the pure awareness. So what it means is that pure awareness is that which is distinct from and can never coexist with objects or shares, uh, or objects or phenomena, um, and, and which therefore excludes them entirely. That's why I, I loosely translated Vyadi Reka as antithetical. It's the, very, it's the exact opposite of the shares. That is, you can't have pure awareness and the shares together. So long as the shares uh, appear, the pure awareness seems to be impure. Of course, pure awareness always remains pure. It's ever unaffected. It's only in the view of ego but, uh, that the shares appear. But only when ego subsides, is dissolved back into its source, only when ego is swallowed, does pure awareness alone remain. And in the in the absence of ego, we share the absence. So uh, the pure awareness is antithetical to the shares. It can, they, it can never coexist with the shares. So since pure awareness alone exists, the shares never actually exist at all. They seem to exist only in the view of ego. And ego seems to exist in whose view? Only in the view of ego. So if, if we as ego turn our attention back to ourselves to see what we actually are and recognize ourselves to be pure awareness, ego is thereby destroyed, and pure awareness alone remains. Aaron actually is always showing us his real beauty, but in order to see what he is showing us, we must turn back to look at it. If someone is showing us something, and we're looking in the opposite direction, we can't blame the person who's showing us. The person who, who is to blame for not seeing it, we are not look, looking at it. So he's always showing his beauty to us. But instead of looking at it, the beauty he's showing us, we constant, we're constantly looking outside. Um, in, in other words, his grace is always doing everything that is necessary to draw us back to him. But it will never force us against our will. So we must be willing to cooperate with it by playing our small part, namely persistently trying to turn back within to see the beauty that he is always showing us. That the beauty he is showing us is in our own heart. How can we see it if we don't look within? So we need to be self-attentive. Then only we can see what he's showing us. Because we are deluded by the shares, which are the play of Maya, as Murugana says, we continue to roam among them. But if we sincerely wish to free ourselves from this delusion, we must try our best to persistently look back within to see the real beauty of our natural, which always exists and shines in our heart as pure awareness, I am, devoid of all upadis, adjuncts, and therefore devoid of all vikalpas, changes and differences. That is, changes and differences appear, apply only to phenomena. In the absence of upadis, when we, we are not aware of ourselves as a form, no other forms appear. And without forms, there are no vikalpas, no changes or no differences. Therefore, it is necessary for us to cooperate with his grace by persistently trying to look deep within ourselves to see him shining in our heart as our fundamental awareness of our own being, I am, thereby surrendering ourselves entirely to him. 
Um, so though that is necessary, what motivates us to do so is only his grace. Because without his grace, we would never have even the slightest inclination to look within or to surrender ourselves to him. That is, we will look within only to the extent to which we love to know and to be what we actually are, which is our natural. So since the nature of the mind is to roam about the world by constantly looking outwards, whatever love we have to look back within does not originate from our mind, but the nature of mind is to look outward. It comes only but from his grace. Therefore, since the very nature of the mind is to roam about the world, searching in vain for happiness in one vishaya after another, it will be unwilling to turn back within to see our natural shiny eternally in the heart as I am, or it will be willing to turn back within to see our natural shiny eternally in the heart as I am, only to the extent that it is drawn within by the all-powerful attraction of his grace. Since the nature of the mind is to constantly seek happiness, and since it will not subside forever until it uh, experiences happiness in its infinite and eternal fullness, it will be drawn to look within only to the extent to which it is made to see but infinite and eternal happiness, but the infinite and eternal happiness it is seeking is its own real nature. Therefore, since our nature is our own real nature, Swarupa, he alone is the real happiness that we are constantly seeking. So this happiness is what Bhagavan refers to in this verse as his beauty. And this is why he prays, so that seeing you uninterruptedly, the mind, which by its very nature roams incessantly about the world under the sway of its Vishaya Vasanas, subsides in you, show me your beauty. The mind will not subside and thereby cease roaming about the world in search of happiness until it looks within itself deeply and keenly enough to see the beauty of our natural, its own real nature, shining within it as the infinite and eternal fullness of real happiness. And it will not look within until his magnetic attraction draws it within to see his beauty. So which is to come first? Are we to look within to see his beauty, or is he to show us his beauty to make us look within? This is a question that cannot be answered either way, because it is based on an erroneous assumption, namely that our looking within and his showing his beauty to us are two distinct things, which they are not. We can see his beauty only by looking within, and he can show us his beauty only by making us look within. He is ourself as we actually are. So since he and his grace are never anything other than ourself, it is only through his grace that our sorry, it is only through ourself that his grace must work. When we look within, it is his grace that is making us look within. So when we look within deep enough to see his real beauty, it is his grace that is making us see it or showing it to us. So long as we look outwards and thereby roam about among the countless vishayas that constitute the world, we do so under the sway of our vishaya vasanas. But when we look back within to see his real beauty, we do so only under the sway of his grace, which shines, which is what shines in our heart as sattvasana, the love to hold on to our own being, I am, which is, I am is our own being, sat which is his beauty, Arahu, and his real nature, Swarupa. Uh, it is therefore up to us to choose whether we want to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas or by his grace. The freedom to make this choice is ours by our very nature. That is, we are always free, either to look outwards or to look back within. And every moment we are exercising this freedom one way or other, so long as we allow ourselves to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas, we will continue to roam incessantly about the world. But if instead we yield ourselves to the sway of his grace, we will be drawn to look back within, to see his beauty shining in our heart as our own real nature, I am. Therefore, 
when we pray to him wholeheartedly to show us his beauty so that we may subside back within him, back in him, thereby seeing him eternally without ever leaving or letting go of him, we are beginning to yield ourselves to him, giving our consent to him to take charge of us entirely, to draw us within, to face himself alone. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arunachala Ramanaya Sorry, that was a very long uh, discussion, but that it's because this verse is so pregnant with meaning. There's so much um, that is always in Bhagavan's verses. There's the meaning of the verse. But we need to see not only the meaning, but what is the implication of the verse. And all of Bhagavan's verses have far greater implication than just the meaning. In this case, the, the implication is so, so deep. So to do justice to this um, extremely important verse, um, I, I spent so long, I've been talking for more than an hour and a half about it.